here we are, fight fans. Another great career profile for you. An education, probably for everyone in this particular episode, especially ourselves. It's a really, really great career profile to be doing. Yes, it's another career profile of a fighter who was fighting over 100 years ago, but that doesn't matter. This is the whole point of career profiles. It's about giving the variety and giving different lives and different areas of time and how these stories uh, all can resonate with us in some way, shape or form. So today's career profile is all about Sam Langford, a guy that maybe you do know, you may have heard his name around, you may have seen people on social media talk about some of the great heavyweight fighters of yesteryear. And Sam Langford was one of them, who is very underrated, very undervalued as a fighter. And over the course of doing the research for this episode, myself and you, Johnston, we've been really enthralled and embraced by what Sam Langford was all about. And this is a great way of presenting him to people that may not know who he is or what he was all about. Oh, mate, absolutely hit the nail on the head there. And, you know, he is the guy that people forget. He's an absolute legend. ESPN called him the greatest fighter nobody knows, and, and that's so precise. I mean, he was his highest weight was 185 pounds, and he, he barely he, today I mean, he would have barely made cruiserweight, you know. But he fought from lightweight all the way up to heavyweight, and he defeated many world champions and legends in in the time of each weight. So this is an absolute legend, and I'm sure at, at the end of it, when you hear some of these names and you realise just how good this this guy was. I think maybe some people will be sticking him quite high up on their greatest ever box of all time because he certainly is that for me. So we're going to go all the way back to the beginning and chronicle Sam Langford's journey through boxing. He was born Sam Edgar Langford. He was the sixth out of seven born on March the 4th, 1886. But the actual date of Sam's birth was often debated in later years. Many people assumed he must be older. But the man who became his fight manager, Joe Woodman, ultimately tracked down Sam's birth certificate and confirmed the date. He had three brothers. The oldest was Charles. He had William, a.k.a. Walter, and Robert, a.k.a. Amos. His three sisters were Annie, Sophia, and Alan May. Sam's parents were Charlotte Langford, who stood at five foot tall, and Robert, also known as Bob Langford, who was actually six foot three. Now, at Sam's full height, he actually stood at only five foot six and a half inches, but was the tallest of the boys in his family. The girls, however, they inherited their dad's genes, standing at six foot tall. They lived in Weymouth Falls, a black Nova Scotian settlement within the district of Clare in Digby County, located in the Canadian province of Nova Scotia, which was near the village of Weymouth. It was established by the African-Canadian community, and it had a strong Langford heritage, which dated back over a 100 years. Sam's great-grandfather, William Langford, who was enslaved to Captain Langford of Shrewsbury, New Jersey, is said to have escaped and sailed to Nova Scotia. Bob was a mariner and well-known amongst the community as someone who liked a good scrap. There is actual evidence from a descendant of William of heavyweight fighter Michael McGowan that he died from a head injury suffered in a fight with Bob. Interesting uh, heritage there for the Langford family, um, coming from the slaves basically the slave trade and the family did live in a small bungalow style house which consisted of two rooms on the ground floor and an attic where they all slept now education was basically non-existent it was too much of an interference with their work now when sam was 12 his mother actually passed away on october 1898 which meant that his older sisters had to fill their her void Sam began to hang with a group of older boys and ended up getting caught nicking some eggs. Now, the theft went to court and the judge actually decided to either pay $15 or he'll go to prison for 15 days. Now, his dad did have the money. He could have paid the fee, but he decided that the 15-day stint in prison would teach Sam a better and a harsher lesson. Now, once that sentence was up, Sam was met at the gates by his dad, who said, I guess there will be no more stealing. And Sam agreed. (laughs) Well, that's one way to punish your child by letting him sit in prison for 15 days. Wow. So at this point, we're going to move into the part of his life where things do take a little bit of a different turn for him. His dad, Bob, was a drinker and he actually often punished his kids. And Sam remembers that he beat the hell out of him when he came back home drunk. One day, his dad gave Sam some money and asked him to collect some food for the family. On his way, he bumped into some mates and he spent the day playing out. 
When he returned empty handed, his dad dished out another one of his beatings. The next day, Sam, who was in his early teens at this point, grew tired of his bossy sisters and violent father and he made his way to Digby, 20 miles from Weymouth, and found work through the winter. He worked as an ox driver and a log hauler, getting paid $1.25 per week, plus room and board. Sam returned to Weymouth in the spring, but not his home. His father was quoted as saying, The home was here for him, but he didn't see fit to come back, and I didn't ask him. He could please himself. <laughs> I'm not surprised, to be fair. By the sounds of what his dad was like, I couldn't understand why he decided to do that. And So instead of returning home, he actually lived in barns and wherever else he could lay his head, and he... Basically, he was earning enough money to eat until, ironically, he followed in his dad's footsteps and he actually became a, a marina. After a few months, the boat had actually sunk and he and all the crew all escaped on lifeboats, obviously unscathed. They were OK, but it was a dampener on that career. Excuse the pun. And uh, he then decided to move back to working on land. He found work as a kitchen assistant in a logging camp for the next three years, working at a rate of $5 per month, plus room and board. Now, while on the job, he did meet a guy called Dr. Blodgett, who actually practiced in the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. The doctor visited the lumber camp often, and he actually offered Sam a job on his farm in Lincoln, New Hampshire, and he accepted. Now, while working for the doctor, Sam became infatuated with Bob Fitzsimmons' victory over gentleman Jim Corbett, mainly because his father shared the same name and because he was a fighting man too. Sam ended up challenging one of the other boys on the farm, saying he could whip anyone like his father and Bob Fitzsimmons. After beating up the guy, Sam was targeted by the older and bigger kids, which led to more barn fights. Then one day, the doctor walked in on a fight involving Sam and said, What's this all about? Sam responded. Oh, we're just playing a little. Not impressed, the doctor said. So you're the cause of all these beating up boys, eh? Well, you're all through playing around here. Pack your clothes and get gone. And that's exactly what he did from the farm. He worked then as a bricklayer in Cambridge, Massachusetts and cut down trees. But he was sacked from both jobs, yet again, for fighting. He ended up selling newspapers and grooming horses to keep him ticking over until he decided to hike to Boston, where one of his sisters lived. By 1901, at the age of 15, Sam was able to get a hot meal with his sister some days and find a more affordable room to live. Yeah, funny enough, I mean, when he was grooming them horses, he was actually living in the barn with them, apparently, as well. So he'd rather live in the barn with horses than go home and live with his dad. So it just sort of says something to it, doesn't it, really, in terms of what it was like living with his father. And So in desperate need of a job now, obviously getting sacked by all some of the jobs. He's obviously selling newspapers, etc., but it's not really enough. And he's in desperate need of a better job. And he'd become the cleaner of a saloon for a bartender called Mike Foley. Now, he actually gave him a wage and, once again, bed and board, plus a little bit extra that he can use to spend. And one day, Mike left Sam in charge of the bar while he attended to a funeral. Now, a customer walks in, drinks a load of drinks, loads of beers, and he decides to leave without paying. Sam chased the man, who he later discovered was actually the undisputed heavyweight champion of Cambridge Street. He was actually called the champ, and the champ went to punch Sam. But Sam, obviously being a bit of a fighter himself, he slipped it and put one on him, landed smack bang on his face, and he put him down. Put the 170-pounder on the seat of his pants. Now, after getting up twice more, he put him down again. Then the former champ, because that's what he'd become, he paid what he owed. Uh, when Mike actually returned from the funeral, he actually witnessed the altercation. He was in shock that a 15-year-old boy who weighed no more than 125 pounds had beaten up the heavyweight champ. The victory made Sam the new undisputed heavyweight champion of Cambridge Street. Oh, what a story. Oh, I love it. It's a Brilliant. great story, isn't it? 125 pounds, Sam Langford drops a guy that's what? 45 pounds heavier than him <laughs> and is a fully crazy. fledged adult as well this is absolutely crazy and you can just imagine it. it this thing doesn't happen in this day and age but you can just imagine this happening now unfortunately his newfound fame was short-lived with businesses in the area collapsing and sam once again found himself homeless while living rough on park benches he found a new companion a small scruffy dog Together, they roamed the streets for work until Sam found an old newspaper that printed the results of a fight in a club nearby. 
Sam and his new little mate made their way to the club where they met Dowser Dowling, the club manager, and Mr Joe Woodman, the owner of the club and a local pharmacy. Horrified at the sight of the both of them, Joe gave Sam some money to eat and accepted Sam's offer to clean up his bar. Sam did such a great job, he became the club porter and the night security guard, which doubled up as a room for the night, sleeping on a gym mat with his dog. Sam would step in as a sparring partner for some of the fighters on occasions, which helped demonstrate that he had something. But Joe didn't allow Sam to fight any of the professional fighters until he had picked up some amateur experience. So Joe actually arranged for Sam to attend the Roanoke Athletic Club to learn his trade. But he actually never witnessed Sam in action. He won a few bouts, won a watch, then won some more, and then won another watch, which he actually sold for $20. Now, with those earnings, he bought himself a new suit, rented a hotel room and feasted on a big, fat, full chicken dinner. And after spending a few days away from the club, he actually returned to carry out his day job. While working, he met Eddie Keevan, who was the manager of a bantamweight at the time. It was Jimmy Walsh, who would later become the American bantamweight and featherweight champion. Well, he was the champion of the world. I think he now goes down as the champion of the world in 1912. So Eddie agreed to let Sam work with Walsh for a few months who taught him how to hit, how to faint and how to get inside of his punches. And, and I tell you what, I mean, it must have been great advice because we'll see as we move along in this story just how good he was at getting on the inside of fighters. Now, Joe began to notice that Sam was a quick learner, so he agreed to put on a three-round amateur fight against Jack McVicker on January the 13th, 1902. In his corner was Mike Foley. Years later, Sam actually gave an interview on his fight with McVicker and he said, You see, I'd been trying to box McVicker and I couldn't get in a decent punch against the more experienced man. I thought I was supposed to box scientifically and I was not as advanced as McVicker in that regard. When Sam returned to his corner after the second round, he told Mike Foley that he was through with getting beaten up. But Mike told him, Fight that man the way you did in my saloon, Sam. You can beat him that way. Forget all the scientific boxing and tear into him. Sam asked, is that rough business allowed here? Mike replied, hell yeah it is. Sam came out a different fighter in the third and final round and did enough to get the decision. And he said, I thought you had to be clever to win. Man, talk about being green. (laughs) Brilliant. Uh, The stories this guy's got is is fantastic. And it's not just from Sam as well, it's from all these people that surrounded him. Now, obviously, the next step was to turn pro and... So after that lesson, Sam won a few more fights, including uh, another three-rounder against Mick Vicker, which was enough evidence for Joe Woodman to turn him professional. And his first pro fight came against Mick Vicker. But before their scheduled bout, Joe gave Sam some words of wisdom. And he said, this business of winning decisions isn't enough. Stop being so nice with these fellas. Knock them dead. That's the thing. That's what you said you were going to do. Now... I'll get you, McVicker, again, and this time you go and knock him out. That's exactly what he did, finishing off the fight with a knockout in the sixth round, earning $25 for himself. After the victory, Joe gave Sam more advice. He said, the quicker you do, the less work you have to do. Never work any harder than you have to. Unfortunately, the club was forced to close due to a young fighter dying after a fight which resulted in uh, basically Sam once again disappearing to New Hampshire and work in, as a lumberjack once again. Now, without his little dog, they departed at some point. He had this scruffy little dog in it. They departed on his way, on his travels uh, and the freezing winters. It wasn't long, basically, before Sam had done enough. And he returned to Boston in search of Joe Woodman. When Sam tracked Joe down at his pharmacy, looking worse for wear once again, Joe told him to stick around because he had the talent to be a decent professional boxer and earn some money. Sam was happy to embark on a career as a boxer and he asked Joe, are you going to manage me? And Joe replied, yes, somebody's got to stop you from running into the wood whenever you get spring fever. Now, no contract was ever written up or signed, but they verbally agreed to Joe earning 25% of Sam's fight purses and he resumed his career on January the 15th, 1903. This was when a former middleweight, George Byers, entered the fold and began to teach Sam how to set himself to make his punches more powerful, how to throw short punches, how to trick his opponents to get into position so that he could land those shots and the art of defence. George advised Sam, Always remember... And the best thing in this fight game is not to get hit. It doesn't matter if you can hit hard enough to knock down a building. If you can't avoid getting hit, 
because how do you know that the other fella ain't going to knock you down before you can hit him? Always remember, don't get hit any more often than you can avoid. Great bit of advice there from George, and, and it, it stuck with Sav. He's like a sponge. He took all this information in, and but he, he was still very green and not acclimatised to George's teachings, and Sam was unable to knock out as many opponents as he would have liked. Now, a prime example of that came on April and June of 1903 against Danny Dwayne and a guy called Andy Watson, whose experience was the major factor in Sam's first professional losses. Although online records suggest the Watson loss was a no contest, others indicate that it was a newspaper decision in the veteran's favour. Now, Dwayne was only the second fighter that Sam faced in 17 bouts that had a winning record, and he also outpointed and outfought the naive at the time now 17 year old and it was over 12 rounds i mean already 17 year old he's rolling out 12 rounds against his experienced guys sam never managed to get a rematch with Dwayne, a man he credited as having the fastest hands of all the opponents he ever faced joe woodman also lost a 500 dollars bet which was part of the contract which is something we'll go into later with a lot of these fights these these con these contracts were added with a little bet on top of it now, two weeks after the Dwayne loss, Sam outpointed Belfield Walcott over 20 rounds, and he was the brother of Barbados Joe Walcott, and knocked out another guy called Peter Sweeney in the 20th and final round in November. Now, by December the 8th, 1903, Sam had a record of 16 wins, half of those by knockout, one loss, and seven draws, before his toughest opponent to date, lightweight champion, Joe Gans, a.k.a. the Old Master, who had a record of 134, 8 and 17. Now, Gans had won the title in 1902, but was unable to find willing opponents in his weight class, which meant he had to fight at a higher weight class. Sam's manager, Joe, was having similar problems finding opponents in the lightweight or welterweight divisions. 147 was probably Sam's more natural weight, which is why the fight was made. Within the contracts... There was the same condition as a Dwayne fight, and that was an additional $500 bet up for grabs. Sam was warned by fans that Gans was a world-class fighter that had brilliant skill and power, but he wasn't bothered. In fact, his ignorance was a blessing because he wasn't overwhelmed by the time he faced off with Gans in the ring. Sam explained how good Joe Gans was to Ed Hughes in an interview in 1927, and he said, Gans was the coolest, calmest fighter I ever met or saw. No matter what was happening to him, he never lost his temper, never changed the expression on his face. Many fighters, when hurt, show it in their faces. Joe never did. Many fighters, when ready to hit, tighten their lips, half close their eyes, or give a tip off in some way as to what's going to happen. Joe never did. A wonder of wonders, that was Joe Gans. Great words there from, from Sam. And, and the fight itself was actually a towel of two halves, with Gans taking the first, and almost stopping Sam in the fourth round. They actually had to use smelling salts, and plenty of water on the sponge basically helped Sam to recover. Now, Sam fought valiantly in front of his home fans and hurt Gans on a number of times, but both ended the fight on their feet with no knockdowns. The verdict by the referee was a Sam Langford victory, and at the night of question, he was actually called the new lightweight champion of the world. To celebrate... Sam went to a cabaret with some friends. Ironically, Joe, Gla Joe Gans was also in the same place. And Joe Gans, being a true champion and a gentleman that he was, he approached Sam and he said, boy, you're going to be a great fighter someday. You're the first man that ever puffed my lips. Take care of yourself. Don't get a big head. And nobody can keep you from being a champion. Now, Sam's lightweight reign, as I said two minutes ago was it lasted a day literally 24 hours he was stripped to the title basically because he didn't make the 135 pound limit which meant that Gans kept the title now Gans extended his generosity by showing Sam how he could improve further and Sam said in my opinion Joe Gans was the greatest all-round fighter when you consider brains boxing corners speed and ability to take it and power to give I learned more from him than any fighter ever faced in my fight with him and from the knowledge he shared with me afterwards when he was given some, some words of wisdom. Now, the two performances by Sam against the two best lightweights of their time and beyond urged Joe Woodman to sell his pharmacy and concentrate on being Sam's full-time trainer. Sam Langford was possibly 
just possibly the greatest fighter who ever lived. Uh, he was a man who weighed anywhere from 145 to 160 pounds, and within a short time, very few heavyweights would risk uh, their undefeated record or risk the title against him. Now Sam fought his 26th fight of the year to a draw against another big name in Jack Chappie Blackburn. He was 22-1-5, the future trainer of Joe Lewis. Now it was a pre-arranged verdict. If the fight went the distance, Sam and Blackburn embarked on a six-fight rivalry that spanned over a two-year period. In total, they drew four times, Sam won one, and the last was a no contest. The third was the best of the lot, which took place at the Highland Athletic Club in Marleyborough, Massachusetts, on December the 9th, 1904. Sam knocked Blackburn down three times in the opening round and continued to batter him for six rounds. But the tide changed in the eighth when Blackburn landed a vicious punch that put Sam down. When Sam returned to his corner in disarray, he said, Listen, Joe, if you see that boy hit me again like he did in that round, just drop everything you are doing and get me an undertaker. Black Blackburn continued to pound Sam around the ring until the 10th when the fight began to even out. In the end, Sam thought he did enough to win, but the result was given as another draw. Sam always praised Blackburn as the fighter who had the most heart. Now, two days after the third fight, Sam settled down and he actually married a dressmaker by the name of Martha Burrell on December the 7th, 1904. So his life is taking, taking a good change now. He's fighting... Chappie Blackburn, he's having all these wars with Chappie Blackburn, he's settling down, he's getting married, he's still pretty young at this point, bearing in mind he's been involved in all these fights already, so things are starting to take a, a really good turn for him. Definitely, and, and the fact that he's a lightweight, I mean, he, he's walking around as a welterweight, but he's fighting at lightweight and boiling himself down, um, keep himself fit, and he, you know, he, he was a uh, he was keen on his fitness at the time. It will change, unfortunately, but um, we'll, we'll get into that. But but two weeks before Langford and Blackburn fought in their third fight on November 25th, 1904, Sam took on a guy called Tommy O'Sullivan in, in Massachusetts again. Now, it was this fight that Sam really began to find his power and obviously that advice from George. Sam had taken the fight as a last-minute replacement when Blackburn was actually taken ill. Joe Woodman was quoted as saying, I'll never forget that night. Quite by accident, Sam snapped his wrist as he delivered a right to Sullivan's jaw and at the same time leaned into the punch. No one was more surprised than Sam was. Sullivan dropped to the canvas unconscious. From then on, he was the killer he wanted to be. But before both those fights, Sam had fallen to his third loss, but second recorded defeat against a guy called Dave Holly, known for his awkward crouch stance and defensive style. They would fight again another three times over the space of one year. And even though Sam should have been given a decision in the last two of those, they were all called even, which is something they tended to do on a regular basis. And Sam was never able to extract that revenge that he wanted against his Dave Holly. Sam was making a name for himself and he managed to get himself a shot at the welterweight world title against another legend in the sport. And that guy was Barbados Demon. Joe Walcott, who was 87, 15 and 17, which took place in the open air arena in Manchester, New Hampshire. It was during the lead up to the fight that Sam was given his famous nickname. Tad Dorgan, a leading newspaper man and famous sporting cartoonist of the day, decided to cover the fight. He asked a group of young black women who they thought would win the fight and how. And they said, why our baby, of course, or something of that note. Walcott, Tad asked. The girls laughed and replied, Don't you know that Sam Langford is our baby? Tad combined the young lady's tagline with the colour of Sam's skin and the fact that he was fighting out of Boston and he came up with the Boston Tar Baby. Now the nickname stayed with Sam for the rest of his life. Walcott tried to intimidate Sam in the ring just before the bell with a racial slur which we're not going to repeat but for Sam it didn't bother him although he was anxious about fighting such a powerful puncher. Arthur Lumley, editor of the New York Illustrated News, reported on the fight the day after and he explained that Langford took more than the first half with Walcott coming back in the second with a tight finish and he explained The decision of a draw was not well received and it is safe to say that Walcott's retention of his welterweight championship hung by a thread. Lumley gave his personal opinion as well in this report and he said Langford was entitled to the verdict. Watch this well-built fighter. He looks like a sure thing to win either the welterweight or middleweight championship, though he may outgrow both divisions before he reaches his peak. Sam said of this fight years later, 
My oh my, wasn't Joe Walcott a tough boy? He was the hardest hitter I ever met. Never before or never since then I have I ever been hit as hard and as often as that night. And I never landed more blows on a fighter in 15 rounds than I hurled into Joe Walcott that night. The house was in an uproar before the first round ended and from then until the end of the fight the customers never sat down. Crazy. I mean the fact that the old the, the Boston tar baby i mean today i mean that is it's, you would never use that today i mean it's, it's it's so racist it's unbelievable really i think people change his name a little bit as well and they call him a is it the bone crusher from boston or something people have switched it up a bit or just called him tar baby but i mean that's just, you can't get any more racist than that but you know the fact that he, he fought Barbados walcott and and he he produced some great i mean you hear it there from from the report i mean he he, he took him all the way and this is a, a welterweight champion and he, he escaped with it i mean he should have won that title that night but it wasn't to be but by may 26 1905 sam was fighting for the 46th time against another rival that he would face six times all in all and that guy was young peter jackson who was 72 21 and 22 he was actually named by mistake by his manager who, who, who basically forgot his real name and told a reporter that he looked like a young Peter Jackson. And it just stuck. So that's why his name was called Young Peter Jackson. Sam took on his biggest opponent in the form of the Baltimore Dame. He was, he was a massive guy and they fought back to back in May and June with Sam winning both on points over 15 rounds. Now, on July 4th, Sam lost a 10 round decision against Larry Temple, but he did finally avenge that loss with a knockout victory in their third meeting and he outpointed him again in their fourth and the fifth fight. So, you know, <laughs> I think he, he got the benefit of him there. Sam was beginning to earn some decent money and he loved to spend it on luxury items like gold watches and encrusted diamonds on his necklaces, etc. Now, his love for the extravagance is slightly diminished in terms of when he the way he looked. He never wore jewellery on him from, from this one particular encounter with a gentleman on the train that actually recognised Sam Langford at the time and he wished him well. And when Sam and Joe arrived at their destination, Sam told Joe, like, what a nice man he was. Like, he was really a lovely geezer. And Joe replied, the fellow was a guy called J.P. Morgan and he's actually the richest man in the world. And Sam was just so shocked and he said, oh my God, the richest man in the world, he didn't have a single diamond on him. And from that point, he never overindulged in, in the much of the luxury gear that he wore in terms of his jewellery and stuff. But just shows you how naive and young that Sam Langford was, meeting the richest man in the world. And then he, he took on, just by looking at him, wow, well, he don't wear nothing and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the same. But it makes you a target, doesn't it? You know, you wear all that stuff, surely. Back at that yep. period of time, there was a lot of people, you know, still coming from the sort of Western period in America where you'd get these guys that were highwaymen, basically, and they'd look to try and rob people of all. I mean, they wouldn't have tried to rob Sam Langford because he would have fucking punched the <laughs> shit out of them, of course. But it's just, it's a good story. I like it. I like the fact that he's, you know, that the guy who had all the money in the world didn't need to wear all this. He didn't need to show it off. And it was that lesson that he learned from seeing that that, that made him become a better man for it now we're moving to another part of the story and we're going to enter a certain joe Jeanette and heavyweight fights he met the legendary heavyweight joe Jeanette in their first of a total of 14 fights in december Jesus. of 1905 so his first fight with him was december in 1905 but they fought 14 times sam always recalled that he used to like fighting the bigger men because they were slower and although a considerable weight difference, Sam was able to knock Jeanette down and many reports suggest that he almost stopped his bigger opponent. In the end though, Jeanette's size came to fruition as he pounded Sam until his corner decided he'd seen enough and threw in the sponge. Not a towel back then, it was a sponge. <laughs> Undeterred by the defeat, Sam felt confident that he would beat him in a rematch. And he got his wish the following year in May of 1906 and he brought the knowledge from the first defeat with him to produce a stunning performance. Sam mixed up his shots a lot more in this fight to the head and body which slowed Jeanette down. Sam had his man in all sorts of trouble in the 15th and final round but he was saved by the bell and his corner who had to stop him from hitting the canvas. Sam was awarded the victory on points and it put him in line to face a certain legendary fighter of that time Jack Johnson, who was 35, 5 and 6, who had six highly competitive fouts himself with Joey Jeanette. The fight was agreed to take place on April 26, 1906 at the Lincoln AC in Chelsea, Massachusetts. Now, considering Johnson 
outweighed Sam by 40 pounds, towered him by about 7 inches and was considered to be one of the best heavyweights in the world, the conclusion was surely inevitable. Yes, you would assume so, and by all accounts, Sam took an almighty beating at the hands of Jack Johnson, who won on point over the 15 rounds. But many observers gave Sam rave reviews for managing to stay the distance with such a formidable force. Sam did land a beauty in the second round that had Johnson in a world of trouble, and some reports actually suggest that he knocked the big man down. But Joe Woodman said this years later, I was anxious to fix up another fight between the two. And knowing Jack's pride, I invented the story of that knockdown to goad him into the ring against Sam again. Although it never happened, all the newspapers believed it. They just never took the trouble to investigate it. That knockdown was just a publicity gimmick. Now, interestingly, Johnson would contradict himself what Woodman said on the subject in 1910 when he actually wrote I think he was like you wrote this book and it was it was something to do with I don't think it was in French but it was released in France and he wrote in this book in all my pugilistic career not before and not afterwards have I received a blow that struck me with such force he continued I got back on my feet just as the referee was about to count to 10 I made it by assure you that I felt the effects of that punch for the rest of the fight. But then again, it changed. So then in 1904, Johnson did not mention the knockdown or if it actually did happen. But he told the ring at the time that reports showed that I gave poor Sam such a severe trimming that he had to find his way to a hospital to recuperate. The records of that fight prove that statement to be correct. So years later, obviously, this is around the time when people will, will go into some of the, the rumours that were going about with Jack Johnson and Sam Langford. So that's probably why he said that. But seven years later, Johnson did tell Kevin Awood, a trustee of the New England Sports Museum, Sam Langford was the toughest little son of a bitch that ever, ever lived. Now, interestingly, Sam and Johnson would fight only once more. But it was only an exhibition. It's not on record in any, any of their records. And it was just to raise money for the victims from a San Francisco earthquake. Great, again, to hear the story of him fighting Jack Johnson. And it's funny about the stories, how they contradicted each other and the fact that they, they said this to the newspapers so that the newspapers would take it away, they would sell it to the public and the public would want to see the fight again. So it's very interesting exactly. the type of tactics that, that they were using to try and get these guys back in the ring once more time. Now, moving forward in Sam's career, he actually lost in his next fight to young Peter Jackson by stoppage. He retired on his stool saying he was injured from a low blow that the referee had missed, but he did avenge that loss five months later. In fact, their bout on November the 12th, 1907 at the Pacific Athletic Club in Los Angeles was billed as being for the World Coloured Middleweight Championship and Sam won the title by beating Jackson on points in the 20-round bout. Sam had kicked off 1907 with a draw against Joe Jeanette in January, but now a fully-fledged middleweight who was going the distance with heavyweights, there was no one in this division that wanted to fight him. He could not find a single opponent willing, and that list included guys like Stanley Ketchell, Billy Papke, Hugo Kelly and Kid McCoy. Frustrated with no fights lined up and now in debt, Sam and Joe Woodman fell out. In desperate need of a fight, Sam went to see Doc Almy, who worked for a Boston Daily newspaper and also served as the American correspondent for sports publications in England, Ireland and France. He managed to agree to a fight for Sam in England and he would earn $1,500 plus expenses for him to fight on April the 22nd against a middleweight named Tiger Smith. So Doc couldn't accompany Sam. Uh, he had to request someone else to go. So he requested the services of a guy called Jim McQuillan, who was managing a local bantamweight fighter named Al Dermon. He accepted as long as Delmon could fight on the undercard and, and he accepted the, uh, that he would he would go there with Sam. Sam, just on a quick side note, Sam actually, the boat was literally about to leave. Sam shows up absolutely pissed as a fart, <laughs> hollering and chatting he owed some geezers a bit of money as well um so we we're hoping to smuggle him on the boat early it didn't happen he came in with his loud self and he tricked a couple of people to basically give him a lift and told him that he was going to come they're going to come to england with him and a load of old bollocks he got on the boat and sort of laughed and blew blew some raspberries at him apparently so just the type of character sam was a bit of a happy-go-lucky type of guy but sam arrived in england at the end of march 
and was an immediate hit with the English due to that happy-go-lucky attitude his flamboyant dress sense. I think he came with a checkered suit or some madness. Sam battered Tiger and Jeff Fawn in Covent Garden before returning home in the summer of 1907, $4,600 richer and back with his old mate, Joe Woodman. Now, the English boxing community made it very clear they would welcome him back with open arms. Now, Sam participated in 32 fights from 1907 to 1910, winning 27, 16 by a knockout, drawing four and losing only one by a newspaper decision against a guy called Fireman Jim Flynn. It was 49, 14 and 2. Now, many fans and also boxing experts uh, suggest that we took Flynn lightly. He came in a little bit overweight, didn't really train too well. But in the rematch, he knocked him out in eight rounds. Now, it was Flynn. This is the guy. Many people may have heard this story. It's the eighth round. And Sam touches gloves with him at the start of the eighth. And Flynn turns around to him, sort of says to him, this ain't the last round, so why are you touching me gloves kind of thing? Which Sam replies, tis for you, son. And he knocked him out in that round. I mean, <laughs> absolute class. And during this period, he did fight another guy called Jim Barry, who he fought him nine times, winning seven, drawing twice, and defeated a much bigger guy in Sandy Ferguson once and drew once and picked up another win and a draw against Joe Jeanette. It's crazy how much these guys fought back then. You know, all the fights he'd have over a three-year period. 32 fights between 1907 and 1910 is a hell of a lot of fights. Fighting one particular guy, Jim Barry, nine times. The story uh, of of Jim Flynn is great. And, uh, yeah, I think a lot of us who, who follow boxing so so much probably know that particular quote but there you go there's that there's that story again once more telling Jim Flynn touching his gloves and telling him this is the last round for you my son now two years before that in 1908 Sam made another visit to London that was his most significant he took on William Iron Haig at the National Sporting Club in Covent Garden London and immediately prior to the beginning of the first round Mr Bettington of the National Sporting Club in London made a remarkable announcement from the centre of the ring he said that in the opinion of many good judges of boxing the contest about to take place was for the world championship the basis for this belief he explained was the fact that Johnson had failed to live up to his agreement to return to the club and face Langford as in Jack Johnson Now, this all stemmed from Mr. Bettinson, who managed Sam during his first time in England. Now, he'd basically borrowed Jack Johnson some money. He'd given him some money in advance and his manager to cover their expenses on the understanding that Jack Johnson would double back after his fight with Burns in Australia to fight Langford in London. Johnson agreed to this and wrote the following prior to departing for Australia. Gentlemen, I undertake and agree to carry out my contest with Sam Langford on the 22nd of February 1909 on the same terms and conditions as already agreed with Langford for $1,000 purse and one third of the interest in any bioscope pictures that may be taken. At the same time, allow me to tender my thanks to you for the courtesy you have extended to myself and my manager, Mr Sam Fitzpatrick, whilst we have been in this country. Yours faithfully, Jay Johnson. Interesting. So, so back to that fight where he's announced that obviously this is for the World Championship. This is what of England. So England's undisputed champion at the time was Haig and obviously his opponent was Langford. And, and Sam actually hit the deck in the fourth round by a right hand to the year. But after returning to his feet, he immediately counted with a perfectly timed right cross that landed on the point of Haig's chin. Something that Sam loved to say. He said, if you're going to hit someone, never go for the did like the side most people go for the side of the chin hit him on the point of the chin apparently that, that that causes more damage that's what he felt now Haig dropped like a stricken ox and that was reported by England's boxing world Haig said after the fight that man can fight I'm not surprised Johnson didn't want to meet him I've had enough of him <laughs> <laughs> that same day Woodman collected fifty thousand dollars in bet winnings wow and ten thousand dollar purse along with the championship belt from the National Sporting Club. Now, although Sam was now considered a heavyweight champion in England, Jack Johnson became the first black heavyweight champion of the world when he defeated Tommy Burns in Australia. Now, once Johnson won the fight and the world title, he said he never signed that contract. He actually said it was his manager that did on behalf of him. There was even photographic evidence of Johnson's signature on this sign on this contract that he refused to accept that he signed, the evidence was there. 
he signed it. He just did not want to fight Sam Langford. And that is what it was. He wanted to earn more money fighting the white guys who were nowhere near as good as the Jeanettes of this world and the Langfords. And he was targeting Jim Jeffries. Sam Langford was one of the great greats of all time. He fought Jack Johnson once before Johnson became champion, and Johnson wouldn't face him again. And there were different reports of how that fight wound up, the first fight. It's recorded under Johnson's record as a W and under Langford's record as a W. Uh, and that was a day and age back in, say, 19 aught that there weren't associated press people at ringside, so it was whatever manager got to the telegraph office first to file a report of who won a fight. Just as Jack Johnson had chased Tommy Burns around the world to get a shot at him in Australia, nobody knows that Sam Lankford chased Johnson around the world for a shot. Almost had one in, in England. They kept chasing him. And when he finally cornered Johnson, Johnson's answer, drawing the color line, was Sam... Nobody wants to watch two black men fight for the heavyweight championship. That's a really crazy story. I, you know, I am very surprised at what that has come across because I obviously, obviously we've watched the Unforgivable Blackness Jack Johnson documentary and they never really sort of put it in that perspective like Jack Johnson was the guy that avoided Sam Langford. Even though, remember, he'd already beat Sam Langford. He'd already yep. beaten him to a pulp in their fight. But... Sam Langford had become a much stronger, a much bigger fighter, much more experienced fighter, and it was like he thought, I don't want this a second time round, I'm not having any of this, I'd, I'd rather not, I'd rather go for the money. So it is an interesting perspective to, to hear about, really, that Jack Johnson did sign a contract, but he decided to go against it. So Sam himself had no choice then but to turn his attentions to the middleweight champion, Stanley Ketchell, who had won the title against Billy Pack in 1909 in July. Newspapers were full of hype for their fight, with one writing this particular statement. Now is the time for Ketchell, and yes, even Tommy Burns to draw the colour line tight and put up the reinforced concrete fences around it. The Lily White champions had better keep themselves Lily White for some time to come, there is a dark man looming up their horoscopes, and they better duck him. Instead of fighting Sam, Ketchell agreed to move up to the heavyweight division and face Jack Johnson, leaving Sam out in the dark. Sam was patient and just said, Ketchell's the man I am after, as well as Johnson, but I suppose I'll have to wait until they settle their differences in California in October. I'll challenge the winner of that fight, and will be $10,000 on the side, if it is agreeable. Even John L. Sullivan publicly said this of Sam. Sam Langford is the world's best and he can trim Johnson, Ketchell, Pack and the rest one after the other. Johnson knows this and he's sidestepping his fellow fighter at every turn of the road. I think even, this is the crazy thing, because you, you hear this contract story and you sort of think, yeah, I mean, we know probably a lot more about Jack Johnson than you do with Sam Langford. And it's interesting because, you, you, as you say, you don't hear about this when it comes from Johnson, John, Johnson's perspective. But you can see any, people around him, you know, the L. Sullivans and even reporters at the time are all saying it. They all know. And there's money around and Jack don't really want it. And, and it's the same with Stanley Ketchell and all the other middleweights. I mean, the fact that you've got a middleweight knocking out fully fledged heavyweights that are considered to be probably the best heavyweights around at this time. You can understand why the middleweights ain't going to want to fight. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, the heavyweights are nowhere near as big as they are today. But still, it's such a massive jump. And Sam Langford's just, he's just breezing through guys for fun. Now, in a surprising turn of events, Ketchell actually did decide to fight Sam. And it was announced for July 31st by New York's Fairmont Athletic Club, who had agreed to stage a meeting between Langford and Ketchell in September. But the New York police commissioner, who was Baker, and district attorney Jerome told William Gibson of the Fairmont Athletic Club that this fight would not be tolerated and that even ordering for such a bout was a, a violation of New York law. They pointed to a section which was a 1.710 of the, the penal code for the state of New York, which prohibited the charging of a fee for reservation of seats or places for an, a boxing exhibition. Now, despite the warning, the club was still confident the fight would take place and they would successfully evade the law by charging club members and sponsored guests alike under the guise of club membership fees. Now, District Attorney Jerome, however, 
went on record and reiterated that stance that the bout was a violation of the section. There was a continued battle going on in the headlines and in, in courtrooms if in New York when the district attorney advised the police would secure warrants for the arrests of those that ordered the fight, Ketchell and Langford, if the club basically went against this law and they called a board meeting in the end, they decided to call the date off, call the fight off, and that was the end of that. Now, on September the 24th, the New York Times reported that the action to call off the fight between Ketchell and Langford had really been initiated by a number of well-known local sporting men who feared for their bets. It's pretty obvious that the white American authorities didn't want another black fighter holding another world title, so they did all they could to prevent Langford from fighting Ketchell. When Johnson and Ketchell finally fought in October, Johnson knocked out Ketchell. After that fight on November 24th, Sam and his manager posted the $10,000 forfeit that Johnson had been insisting as a precondition to fighting Sam. They hoped this would embarrass the champion into accepting a fight. It didn't work as it became clear that Jeffries would meet Johnson that coming summer. Once again, Ketchell became the target with the West Coast promoter James Kofoff very interested in staging the fight. Ketchell's managers were aware of Kofoff's interest, so they approached Woodman and asked him to agree to a six-round no-decision bout between the two fighters to take place in Philadelphia. They promised Joe that if he and Sam would accept the offer to fight Ketchell in Philadelphia on April 27th, they would agree to give Sam an opportunity to fight Ketchell for the title on the West Coast in a longer contest. Sam and Joe agreed to the deal to finally fight the Michigan Assassin for $5,000 significantly less if it was a world title fight. In a last-ditch attempt to make it a world title fight, James Griffin, the matchmaker of the Broadway Athletic Club in San Francisco, offered Ketchell $10,000, but he rebuffed the offer, saying he has no intention of fighting Sam for 20 rounds. No one wanted to touch him with a barge pole, did they? (laughs) I I think it was pretty clear here. it's, It's not even just from one source. It's so many other sources, and it just seems pretty evident. The, the white authorities, they did not want Sam Langford fighting Ketchell because they knew he's going he's, he's gonna to beat him. And if he beats him, you're going to have a, Jack Johnson who's got the heavyweight title and then you've got Sam Langford with a middleweight title. What that would have done as well for Sam, if he held a middleweight title, Jack Johnson probably couldn't have avoided the fight because I think there probably would have been a calling for that fight. But no one wanted Jack Johnson to be champion because he was the colour of his skin. It, oh, the, the politics is crazy. Before their fight in Philadelphia, Sam was actually called by an unknown man who told him not to knock out Ketchell early. The man told him that a couple of gunmen from New York would have him covered from the moment he entered the ring. Now, during the contest, Sam told an Australian trainer who was Duke Mullins, a guy, when he goes to Australia, we'll go to that in a little while, he become his trainer. And he actually said to him, he fought with one eye on Ketchell and the other looking at the gunmen. Now, when the fight got underway at the National Athletic Stadium, It was clear by reports at ringside that Sam was not demonstrating his normal ring generalship. One newspaper report at Philadelphia described one of the rounds as having a slight odour of a rat to it. Now, Tad reportedly said, who is Sam trying to kid? He couldn't hit that badly if he was drunk and and he had one leg cut off. I mean, it was evident that Sam carried Ketchell for those six rounds. And when the bell rang, Sam smiled and he later revealed that he actually whispered in Ketchell's ear. He said, see you in San Francisco, Mr. Ketchell. I feel sorry for him. He gets that phone call basically saying, if you if you don't do what we're telling you to do, we're going to fucking shoot you. So he has to carry Ketchell for, for this fight, for this exhibition. But in a good sense, it turned out better for him because obviously he was going to get his fight for a title in San Francisco. No matter what everyone thought, Sam actually spoke highly of Stanley Ketchell years later by saying he was the most aggressive man I ever faced in the ring. I learned from him what an elegant thing it is just to sort of run in like a wildcat and hit the other boys so fast and so often that he just couldn't get out of his own way. Sam also said that Ketchell was the best white man he ever fought. The result was not official, but using a poll of 13 New York and Philadelphia newspapers, seven had Langford ahead, four Ketchell and two had it a draw. Therefore, a Langford newspaper win. Sam never did get his rematch with Ketchell. Stanley only fought three more times in May and June of 1910, winning all three contests by knockout before 
his untimely death on October the 15th, 1910. Another episode, of course, for our darker side of boxing. <laughs> Sam spoke of Ketchell when his death was made public and he said, Poor Steve, this was Stanley's nickname, he went to the grave thinking he could really lick old Sam. <laughs> oh, I still have a little pop at him there. I'm absolutely gutted, obviously, that he didn't get that fight in San Francisco, but sort of not to Ketchell's fault. Again, I mean, you mentioned Dark Side of Boxing, the way he died and, and everything else that surrounded that is a whole nother ball game. Some some great information there. So after dismantling two more heavyweight monsters, one of them was a guy called Battling Jim Johnson who weighed 240 pounds. I mean, it's, Sam Langford at this time, he's a middleweight. He's probably walking about 160, probably goes into the room about 170, and he dismantles Jim Johnson, who's 240. And Battling Jim Johnson was no mug either. He'd done him... The first of uh, 12 meetings as well that they had. I mean, it's, just, it's not even like one fight. It's, it's 12 <laughs> times. So Sam and Joe, they tried every trick in the book to force Johnson into a fight. And there was a story that while Johnson was actually out doing his road work, one of Sam's tricks was to occasionally quickly drive down the road in front of Johnson and sort of raising up all the dust so it could blow in Johnson's face while he continued his run. <laughs> and they were just trying to goad him. <laughs> it's brilliant. Johnson was preparing for Jim Jeffries and Sam actually offered his services as well as a sparring partner to the former heavyweight champ and also went on record to say that he would never face Jeffries. This is the only fight he ever said this about. He said he would never face Jim Jeffries because he thought that Jim Jeffries would beat him. I think it was just a smoke screen to be honest. None of obviously the, these efforts discouraged Johnson but rumours did surface years later that Jeffries did accept Sam's offer to spar. And the rumour is, once again, Sam knocked him out. Even some suggest that it was a secret fight and Sam dominated Jeffries before putting him down a few times. And apparently some people suggest, again, that the reason for Johnson to win so easily against Jim Jeffries was basically because Sam softened him up. It is all rumours. Who knows? It could be a load of waffle. It's, it's, it's true. It, this time it's so difficult to actually find anything real factual stuff. One thing is for certain, though, the great white hope become the great white dope and he got destroyed by Jack Johnson. <laughs> there was one last attempt to get the Jack Johnson fight who asked while in Boston for $20,000 to be posted to him from Sam and Joe Woodman and he would cover the other twenty k for an agreement for the fight to be made. Although they publicly said they would make the deposit, it would seem like they never had the money in the bank to do that. The $60,000 they had earned in England would have no doubt have been spent because Sam certainly loved to spend. Following the death of Ketchell, Sam had renewed hope that he could get a shot of the vacant title, but once again he was frozen out. From September 1910 to the beginning of 1911, Sam recorded six more wins with four stoppages, two of which were against his old foe, Joe Jeanette. The one in January was called the greatest boxing match ever held in Boston, but their fight on September the 6th, 1910 in Boston, Massachusetts was when Sam Langford became the undisputed heavyweight coloured champion by winning the 15-round bout on points. So something we've not really mentioned over the course of the episode is the coloured world heavyweight championship, which I think it's quite self-explanatory what we mean by that. It was only a title for black fighters. No white fighters ever fought for it. It was only black fighters because they wouldn't allow the black fighters to fight for their recognised world heavyweight title. So they basically created this coloured heavyweight title. That's exactly it. And, and the fact is, is they have so many fights between them like Joe Jeanette, we're going to bring in someone else in, literally in a second, um, and, and Sam Langford. And Jack Johnson, even before that, before he'd become that world champion, they, they sort of fought for the, the title of the coloured world champion. But the fact is, they fought so many times, it passed about. It, it's so difficult. We, we could have sat here and gone through every fight and put in when he won it, when he lost it, when he won it, when he lost it. <laughs> You'd be here all day. It, you could literally just do an episode on that title and just uh, you could probably run through the amount of times it changed hands. But I think the one main thing is it was the undisputed title. I think someone else had it. I think battling Jim Johnson, he had it at some point. They've all, they all sort of had it. But there's no, you know, without a shadow of that, these guys should have been holding the world title and they should have been fighting each other. That's what. If it was today, there would be an absolute uproar. If you, we, we moan about sort of Fury and Joshua, this would have been ridiculous in today's age. We'd have been like, what on earth is going on? So news was beginning to filter through. That there was a young black fighter that was born in Texas that had been in sensational form in Europe and was a possible next opponent for Sam Langford. If he was interested, 
didn't know man of course was sam the oxenal cyclone mcveigh and he he was another guy that was prominent in, in around this time now he held a record of 45 6 and 3 at the time mcveigh accepted the invitation to fight in paris which was perfect for woodman who actually arranged to uh, confirm the bout of a, a promoter at the time was hugh mcintosh to fight the Australian heavyweight, it was Bill Lang in Kensington, in England. So it worked out well, fight in England and then go on to Paris. When Sam arrived in England in February to begin training, he was interviewed by the English Boxing Magazine. And this is what they reported. They said, Sam is just about as ambitious as he can be. He wants to be recognised both as a heavy and a middleweight world champion and feels pretty confident that he can mount both thrones if he is only given the chances. Now, as Sam put it, I may be coloured, but I've got a white heart. And those are Sam's own words. I've gone about beating all these big fellas and never worried about how big they are. If they will give me the chance, I'll beat them all. But some of them fancy themselves as wise guys and just stay aside. The first fight in Kensington was an easy night's work for Sam. He battled Lang for six rounds, putting him down a few times in the process. In the end, Lang was so frustrated at not being able to put a dent on Sam, he hit him with a rabbit punch and was immediately disqualified. Sam told the ref he wanted to continue, but he was having none of it. Sam retired to his corner, where he lit up a big fat cigar before departing from the ring. England's boxing magazine was full of praise for Sam, saying, The greatest fighting machine composed of flesh and blood which the human race has ever seen. On to Paris for the fight with Sam McVeigh in front of 6,000 spectators a month later and Langford was impressed with his opponent's boxing skills, but he wasn't willing to engage. McVeigh fought on the defensive and the counter for the full 20 rounds, with Langford forcing the fight to the delight of the crowd. There were no knockdowns, but Langford's right eye was swollen shut. When the one judge announced the decision as a draw, the partisan crowd threw oranges into the ring in disapproval. They sided with the away fighter Sam Langford. Even McVeigh said, I was defeated, and I am the first to recognise this. Langford is too powerful and too hard. My blows came up against a wall. Incredible to believe, considering that McVeigh was actually 20 pounds heavier and had a 3 inch height advantage, and he was saying that Sam Langford's punches were that hard that anything he was throwing at him, he was just coming up against a brick wall. It's it's crazy, isn't it? 20, 20 pounds heavier... He's got a three-inch height advantage, but yet it's so mad, and it? it's it's hilarious that that he's able to do this. He's got a granite chin, as well as a powerful punch. And so after his visit to, uh, of England and Paris, Sam went home for the first time since he ran away to visit his sick father, and he spent some time catching up with his family while in Canada. He, he actually had another fight as well at middleweight, and he won in uh, Winnipeg. Um, now talk of. Jack Johnson fight were not going away, especially when his promoter or now promoter was Macintosh said he would put up thirty thousand dollars for the fight to be held in England. When Johnson arrived in England with his wife to witness the coronation of King George V, he was asked about the offer, and basically Johnson said, "I'd fight a bear thirty thousand dollars." He was asked if he would fight Sam Langford, to which Johnson replied, he ain't no bear, he's a wildcat. So on October 15th, 1911, just six days after his stoppage of Farmer Jim Smith, Sam faced Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, who was 147, 13 and 24, incredible record, at the 20th Century Athletic Club in New York. Though highly regarded, he was 33 years old at the time and when he took on Sam and he was basically on the dance slide. Even still, an estimated 7,500 were in attendance as Sam was basically called his persona of fire before the fight and he battered Paul O'Brien, flooring him several times until the referee halted the action in the fifth, earning himself $5,000 for his troubles. O'Brien actually described Sam as a mystic quality and when he appeared upon the scene of combat, you know you were cooked. <laughs> that's a great quote <laughs> brilliant uh, now the Australian promoter Hugh McIntosh asked Sam to travel with him to Australia and participate in this mini tournament he was setting up with other fighters and he hoped that some of the other fighters were going to include Al Kaufman now Al Kaufman is the man who Jack Johnson said was the man with the best chance of defeating him there was going to be other fighters apparently included in this tournament, including Jim Flynn, Jimmy Clabby, Bill Capp and Packy McFarland. Now, before Sam agreed to make the trip, he declared that he would fight Jeanette. 
Sam knocked him down three times en route to a 10 round newspaper decision. Before Sam boarded the boat, he said, I'm going to Australia to make him fight me or show him up as a rank coward. If Johnson can't get Hugh McIntosh to agree to give him $30,000, he'll probably agree to meet me, which means that I'll come back here with the championship of the world. But I'll not be satisfied that Johnson really wants to take a chance until I see him in the ring pulling on those gloves. McIntosh was left red-faced when none of the fighters he originally wanted to travel pulled out, probably after realising that Sam would be a part of this mini-tournament. He did manage to get Sam McVeigh and Jim Barry to make the trip, two guys that never ducked Sam Langford. And now a Vancouver newspaper asked the question, where are Sam's guaranteed six fights coming from? They even joked, unless he fights Sam McVeigh six times, ironically they did precisely that, (laughs) fighting six times in 15 months with the addition of three fights with Jim Barry and one with Porky Dan Flynn. Again, like we just can't believe that these, these fighters are just avoiding Sam Langford like the plague. They're just avoiding him. Nobody wants to fight him. The only people that want to fight him are the people that have already been in there with him and, and know all about him and know how to fight him. But anybody else just, just want to stay away from him as much as they can and promoters are the same. They don't want their fighters to go near him. Because he's just so dangerous. He really is. He's just... And they just kept throwing out the car. I mean, all the middleweights at the time, I mean, he moved to to heavyweight. He was probably a light heavyweight by now. But the, they just kept throwing the colour line out, out there because they were just like, you know... They're just not interested. Um, it, that's just how they rolled. It was, it's terrible, really. And this is just why it's such a travesty and why we're telling this story. Because just to, sh- just to share this, all these stories. Now, McVeigh and Langford actually met in the ring for the second time before 20,000 fans. I think it's one of the biggest as well, that. I and mean, it was an extremely hot, sunny day on December 26, 1911 at the Open Air Stadium in Sydney. Now, the bout was scheduled for 20 rounds and was billed as being the championship of the British Empire. Once again, it was almost a carbon copy of the first meeting with Langford, the aggressor, and McVeigh fighting on the counter and more defensive-minded. Langford was put down in the third, but was quickly up. The fight did go the distance with many feeling that Langford did enough, but the decision went to McVeigh. Tommy Burns at ringside said, the decision was awful. Believe me, I mean it too. It was absolutely the worst decision that I've witnessed. So to begin 1912, Sam beat Jim Barry on points after putting him down in the first round. Sam then wanted to set the record straight with McVeigh, with their current score one apiece. Sam watched McVeigh's points win over Barry in the March before their duel was due to take place in April when he later revealed that he had learned more about McVeigh from watching him box Barry that evening than he had from the two fights he had had with him previously. What he realised was that McVeigh was harder to hit when he was on the retreat. So he trained to increase his speed and improve his ability to get in range and hit the target more frequently. His plan worked. As McVeigh was unable to keep Langford off of him, he basically never gave him a moment's rest, even knocking him down in the seventh round en route to a points decision. Langford's right eye was actually completely shut, closed, following the belt, but he felt that at this point that he had mastered Sam McVeigh. Now, Sam won his next two fights in Melbourne against Jim Barry, again, and against Porky Dan Flynn, both by knockout in the 11th and 14th, respectively. Sam explained in an interview about his manager, Joe Woodman's betting problems, and he said, Joe was betting a 1,000 a race in Australia, and I wound up fighting and knocking out Porky Flynn in 14 rounds because Joe had to pay off. I didn't get a quarter from that fight. With Woodman and Langford's friendship being stretched, McIntosh signed Sam on another six-month contract to stay in Australia with the agreement that he would get Jeanette and Johnson within that time frame. Sam would only be happy to stay as long as his wife Martha and four-year-old daughter Charlotte could be brought over. During the month of July, a report surfaced that T.S. Andrews, a Wisconsin newspaper man acting on behalf of Hugh McIntosh, had signed the champion Jack Johnson to a contract to fight both Langford and McVeigh in Sydney, Australia. The report was that Johnson would receive $45,000 plus $5,000 for expenses, along with first-class round-trip tickets for the two fights, which would take place within the next six months. Now, Jeanette hadn't arrived in Australia on time to make the Langford fight, but with a date and venue already set for August 3rd, McVeigh came in as the replacement for their fourth fight. 
In the meantime, Johnson announced his retirement, only to backpedal a few days later, saying that he would meet Joe Jeanette for $25,000 and Langford for $30,000, an extra $5,000 on the original deal. The Battle of the Sams was the worst of all their fights, mainly because of Superintendent Goulder, the police officer in charge of the affair, who interfered on several moments, refusing body punches, but Sam won the fight comprehensively on points. Jack Johnson eventually signed with McIntosh's representative, W.C.J. Kelly, who offered Johnson $50,000 for two fights with Langford and McVeigh, plus another 15000 in forfeit money because Jeanette hadn't made the trip to Australia. <laughs> it's just crazy, isn't it? Jack Johnson just, he's, I think he's taking absolute liberties here, to be honest. I think he's just earning a bit of money from these guys. They're sending the money over to him and he's blatantly spending it and, you know, there's nothing they could do. Is it true? I mean, there's so much documentation here. Um, it's hard to believe that none of it is. I think there's probably, maybe there was just one agreement. And then, uh, w I mean, we'll go into why this didn't happen in a minute. But Langford fought McVeigh for a fifth time. Got a stoppage in the 11th because McVeigh called for a foul. The referee refused to agree and he was basically counted out on his stall. Now, on October 15, Johnson had insisted that before he would depart for Australia, the $15,000 forfeit had to be posted to the USA by the Australian promoter. Two days later, Johnson was arrested in Chicago and charged with violating the Mann Act. The act has been passed, or the act, the act had been passed into legalisation on 1910 to pre, uh, in an attempt to prevent the use of recreational drugs and alcohol and to try and stop prostitution trade uh, at the time more specifically known as the white slave trade now author randy roberts summed up the ridiculous act perfectly he said in theory it meant that any man who took a woman other than his wife across interstate lines and had sexual intercourse with her was basically in grave danger it was a load of old bollocks and they just wanted to get jack johnson because he was the heavyweight champion now with the added problems of the man act and that the fifteen thousand dollar forfeit money had not arrived johnson decided to not take the fights, although McIntosh did counterclaim that. He said that he pulled the plug on the deal, instigating that Johnson was no longer liked in Australia and the fight wouldn't sell, which again, out of rubbish. With the fight with Johnson now off the table, McIntosh got Langford and McVeigh in the ring again for a sixth time and Langford knocked him out in the 13th. After a few legal battles where Sam and Joe went up against McIntosh in, in a court citing money issues, they said they didn't get some certain money they were promised, which they lost. You know, he's never going to win against his promoter, white promoter, Australia, that was loved in the country. They decided they've had enough uh, and they left. Uh, Sam Langford, his wife, and Joe, his daughter, obviously, they all boarded a boat and went home. Now, upon their return, Sam was notified that his dad actually passed away after battling a long illness on J July 4th of all, of all times, uh, 1913, and Sam basically never got a chance to meet him before he died. Sam was most likely to be in his prime from 1907 to this point, 1912, during that stretch of time where he lost only two bouts. One, I think probably two. Of them. One, he was uh, the Flynn one where he was overweight. The other one was against McVeigh, which was a robbery. The others, 53 fights, and he won the rest. I mean, I'm, I'm real. Now, after a draw and a knockout victory, Sam took on John Lester Johnson for a 10-round bout at the Atlantic Garden Athletic Club in New York on September the 9th, 1913. Upon entering the arena that evening, Sam encountered Johnson stretched out on a rubbing table with a handler fanning him. Sam inquired, What are you doing, boy? Johnson replied, Just taking a little nap. Sam replied, why now? You're going to be taking one in that ring. And that's exactly what happened, as reported by the <laughs> Associated Press. And the Associated Press said, At the gong, Johnson began prancing and stamping around the ring like a horse with the blind staggers. Langford was compelled to take long-distance swings, and the only place he could reach was his opponent's left kidney, which he did until Johnston went down. And the fight was over in the first round. The heavyweight title was still with Jack Johnson, but he skipped his trial date and ran to Europe, Paris, France to be exact. There were still rumours that Johnson would defend his title in Paris, but first Sam and Joe Jeanette had to meet in an elimination fight at Madison Square Garden before an estimated crowd of 2,500 people and a gate of $16,000. 
To the surprise of most and disappointment of Sam who produced a below par performance, Jeanette actually emerged with a 10 round decision victory. Now, I can't believe this was an elimination fight. The amount of times that Sam Langford <laughs> had beaten all these guys already, and yet this was being billed as yet another elimination, and yet Sam's not putting in the performances that he once did, and Joe Jeanette comes out and gets the victory in this one. It's, it just doesn't seem right, does it? And the fact that Jeanette actually fought Johnson, I believe, six or seven times, it may even be more than that, it just shows you, like, why was he going to fight Jeanette so often? But yet, he wouldn't fight Langford so often. He fought all the other guys. Why not Langford? It, it, when you look at the records, it suggests, why didn't he? And I think we're sort of getting the idea of it. So it would all seem, by most observers, that Sam was basically, at this point now, was beginning to show signs of decline. He was certainly showing signs of increased weight, with many saying that he was past his best following a surprise loss to a guy called Gumboat Smith. It was 45, 9 and 6 in Boston. A fight that was actually originally refused by New York because, and this is a, you know something I didn't know, that they were not allowing mixed racial bouts. I never knew that New York still to this date were not allowing mixed racial bouts. So something that if you didn't know, there you know. So following the loss, Sam and Joe sailed to Paris, France to face Joe Jeanette, obviously enticing Jack Johnson here. And they fought for the world heavyweight title as recognised only by the French Boxing Federation, <laughs> who, was, who basically stripped Jack Johnson. Sam won the 20-round decision at the Luna Park Arena. And, and who, those who witnessed witnessed the spectacle by all accounts. Soon after the victory, Sam was stripped of that title issued by the French Boxing Federation. It's just crazy. The French loved Sam, though. They, they loved his... He loved his time there. He made several friends, and one particular friend was a famous painter, Picasso. Sam won another fight in Paris before returning to America, running for four fight win streak. But he was becoming tired of fighting the same fighters over and over, which is understandable. I bet they were bored of seeing him all the time. And the paying public, they, they stopped coming. What's the point in seeing Sam Langford fight Jeanette or McVeigh again? So the gates begin to suffer. Now, all the white heavyweight contenders were all calling the colour line. Jack Johnson was uninterested in fighting Sam who actually called Sam around this time a dangerous fighter. Well, calling him a dangerous fighter, even though many people thought he was on the decline. It just makes me see Jack Johnson in a completely different light doing, doing this career profile. It makes me feel like he really did avoid him like the bloody plague. Now enter another heavyweight in Harry Wills, who was 14-1-2. and two. He was a breath of fresh air for Sam, a fresh-faced young black fighter, a new opponent, and one that was more difficult to beat. They first met in New Orleans on May the 1st, 1914, for the first of 22 fights in total. Now, Wills actually got the win in New Orleans, but other papers gave it a draw. There is at least one unconfirmed report that after his victory, Wills asked Sam to relinquish the belt that he'd been awarded for winning the coloured heavyweight title. The title that Sam had fought for many times against the likes of Joe Jeanette and Sam McVeigh. The belt was studded with a diamond, ruby, an emerald and a pearl. Sam told him to go get it and handed over a pawn ticket. The gold had been dug out and pawned. Sam continued his career, looked unimpressive in some fights, but then reports suggest he looked in better physical shape for other fights. He even managed to win seven on the spin and avenged his loss to Gumbo Smith. That loss for Smith elevated Jess Willard as the new white contender for the heavyweight title. Once again, rumours surfaced about promoters from all over the world saying they had the Langford-Johnson fight agreed, but nothing ever came of it while Johnson continued to stay in Paris. Gumboat Smith was asked who his best opponent was during his career and he said, that's an easy one, Sam Langford, and nobody ever came close to being as good as he was at his peak. Oh, there you go. Um, I mean, he, <laughs> he beats Gumboat Smith and it elevates Jess Willard to be a contender I don't quite understand that again today you put Langford as the main contender would it not it's crazy it's just so fucking racist it's unbelievable Sam was sadly beaten unfortunately by a guy called Jeff Clark on October 26 1914 in Joplin Missouri he basically hadn't trained for the bout spent most of the night chasing Clark around the ring supposedly Sam actually stopped in the middle of the ring and said for the lord's sake man stop long enough to do some fighting you're the scariest ghost i ever seen. <laughs> Observers began to poke fun at Sam by calling him a hog, hog fat. That's basically, he did have quite a bit of fat by the sounds of it, around his belly. 
but it didn't help himself by refusing to train. He just didn't. He trained, but he just didn't train hard enough. It was very. He couldn't be bothered. I mean, there was nothing for him to get up for. I mean, he's fighting his guys, same same fellas over and over again. There's nothing really for him to get his teeth into. And Sam eventually did get the rematch though with Harry Wills on November 26th, 1940 in San Francisco. It started badly as he hit the canvas six times in the first round. Wills was so far up on the cards that Sam knew he needed a knockout to win this fight. So he went in search of throwing haymakers, everything else that he had in his locker. The moment arrived in the 14th round when they left to the jaw and he knocked Wills out and the crowd apparently were in silence. They just couldn't believe what just happened. After the Wills victory, Sam, who now held a record of 109 wins, 10, only 10 losses and 29 draws. And some of them draws were debatable, even some of them losses were debatable, made a commitment to retire from boxing after he had completed the calendar year in 1915. He told a San Francisco reporter... You see, now I'm 28 and this fighting is a tough game. I like to fight, all right, because I like the money. But now I've got about enough coin sorted down to quit and settle down on a little farm. I've got my wife and a baby. I just started the youngster to school. And now I want to quit kicking around and go back home with my wife and baby. It's crazy that at the age of 28, he had won nearly 150 fights. I couldn't think of it off the top of my head, but nearly 150 fights. Wow. And they're the ones that are recorded as well. I know, Sean. exactly. They're the ones that are actually on record. And we know from the story so far that there was a few exhibitions that were never recorded. So that is absolutely crazy at 28 years of age. 28-year-olds in this day and age now, you're lucky if you've had like 20 to 25 fights. It's absolutely crazy. I honestly can't believe that sort of record was had. But then you think about the guys he was fighting up till this point, six times, seven times, 12 times, 20 times. You know, the, these are the types of old school fighters that we've just got to have so much respect for being able to do this. But then, like you said earlier, they were getting so bored of, of, of each other fighting the same fighters all the time. That why would anybody want to come and see the same fight every single week? It's, it's just ludicrous. Now, the year started, 1915, with a 15-round decision over battling Jim Johnson. But the day before, on April 5th, 1915, Jess Willard knocked out Jack Johnson in the 26th round in a Havana, Cuba, and ended any hope of Sam ever fighting for the heavyweight crown. Johnson had held the title for seven years. The International Boxing Union in Paris refused to recognise Willard as the champion until he met and defeated Sam. The union's position was that since Jack Johnson had failed to fight Langford the previous November after the Langford defeated Joe Jeanette, Sam had become the champion by default. This was of little consolation to Sam. He and Joe Woodman realised the union stance would have very little impact. And it, it didn't because it would be 22 years before a white title holder would give a black fighter an opportunity to fight for the prestigious title again. So with his title hopes dashed, Sam knew it would be back to fighting the same guys over and over again. But he ended 1915 with nine more fights, three wins, three losses, two draws and one no contest. The three defeats came against Joe Jeanette, Harry Wills and Sam McVeigh. One reporter summed up the constant round robin between the same black fighters and he said, Everybody laughs when every few weeks Sam McVeigh and Sam Langford are matched. But there is good reason why these two black fighters keep pummeling one another. There's nobody else for them to fight. And I mean, that's what we just keep saying. Uh, what can you do? Uh, they're just, you got, they've got their own money, so they're just going to keep fighting each other. Now, outside the ring troubles began to emerge. Sam found himself in Roxbury, Massachusetts, caught on charges of domestic abuse by his wife, Martha, who claimed he had been badly assaulted by Sam. Sam was always a drinker, and it would seem that he fought with no world title fight against Johnson. Just It's ended. Um, it basically sent him into a bit of a depression. He drank more than he should have, and Martha felt the brunt of his frustrations. He said years later, It was along about then that I became sure that no matter how good I became, I'll never be the world's heavyweight champion because the doors were closed. Up to that time, I had trained rather seriously for practically all my fights, but I got disgruntled and said, what's the use of training? I ain't got nothing. I, I ain't going anywhere in particular, and I wasn't. 
Sam didn't retire at the end of 1915 as he had promised. Instead, he started 1916 with a loss to Wills, but avenged the loss a month later with a knockout victory in the 19th round. Sam would go on to fight Harry 13 more times over the next five years, but he would never defeat him again. The young heavyweight champion was on the up and Sam was on the downward spiral. Now, after one of those losses against Wills, a reporter from St. Louis Dispatch wrote about Sam's performance. And they said, according to his performance against 24-year-old Harry Wills, last night Sam is an absolute battleship. His artillery lacks range through the heavy, heavy calibre. His tonnage is too gross for his altitude and his old engine is unable to develop the speed and endurance of former years. Now, after the Wills knockout win, Sam fought 13 more times, winning eight, losing twice to Wills, and he drew three. One of those draws was against Old Foe in Sam Mervey in Argentina. That same year, a story was released that said Sam was all but broke, despite the money he'd earned in the ring over the previous 14 years. According to Joe Woodman, the primary reason for this was that Sam had turned over all his life savings, $35,000 reportedly, to his wife, Martha, and they were now separated. But that wasn't the only reason. He had either spent it or gave it away to various acquaintances. Sam needed to fight on to make money, and over the next 12 months he fought 13 times, winning 8, losing 4, and drawing once. In one of those defeats, both of his eyes were closed shut, and he was unable to fight on, resulting in a stoppage win for Fred Fulton, who was 28-5. and five. Sam fought Joe Jeanette for one last time in 1917, and he spoke years later about Sam Langford and the reason for Jack Johnson avoiding him for all those years. And this is what Joe Jeanette said. Jack was afraid of Langford, though. He beat Sam once when Sam was only a middleweight, but he wouldn't have had anything to do with him when Sam got bigger and better. He went on to say... Sam would have been champion any time Johnson had given him a fight. And Johnson knew it better than anybody. Man, how that baby could hit, nobody else could hit like that. Well, maybe Joe Lewis could, but don't forget that Sam only weighed about 160 pounds and Lewis was about 195. And that's coming from Joe Jeanette. Joe Jeanette is basically telling everybody that he should have been the champion. He was the uncrowned world heavyweight champion and Jack Johnson didn't want no part of it. And he even goes on to compare him to Joe Lewis. And Joe Lewis was a fully-fledged heavyweight of his own era. So for him to say that about Sam Langford, it just goes to show you that maybe Sam Langford could hang it with any of the, the great heavyweight champions of years gone by. It, it really beggars belief. I mean, on average, I mean, he's saying 160 pounds. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? 160. He's a middleweight. He's a super middleweight. He's not even... He's a, he's a middleweight. middleweight. He's a middleweight. And, and, and I mean, he gets bigger because of his, you know, he, he does get bigger because of his size because uh, he puts on the weight. But my goodness, he's knocking out these big men. Um, it's, it's just, it defies logic. It really does. Now, Sam, he fought about 86 times between 1918 and 1922. And uh, one third of his contests were with four men. Jeff Clark, which was about eight or nine times. Harry Wills was six. Jack Thompson was seven. And Big Bill Tate was seven times. Now, in 1918, Sam travelled to Panama City for two fights back to back with Harry Wills the fact that he's pushing himself fighting this young buck Harry Wills clearly well above him at this point now he had worked hard to reduce that fat for this fight he actually really did get himself involved in this but he was still out of shape he was nowhere near the level he was years ago now in their first encounter Sam was knocked out in the sixth round for the first time in his career he remembers seeing the punch coming but was unable to evade the knockout blow the next thing he remembers is he was waking up in his dressing room and the conversation he had with Joe Woodman. And he's literally out cold in the dressing room. He wakes up and he says, when do we fight? Ain't it almost time for us to go in the ring? That's what Sam asked. Well, you've done all the fighting you're, you're, you're going to do today, replied Joe. Thinking he was joking, Sam asked, what do you mean? And then Joe replies, the fight's over. Sam says, what happened? And Joe replies, oh, nothing except you forgot to duck. <laughs> After a minute, Sam asked, how long ago was it? And Joe took a look at his watch. He looked at it and basically said, one hour and 25 minutes ago. <laughs> oh my um, God. I think you're just getting... <laughs> it, 
devastating punch. Harry Wills was a devastating heavyweight. If he'd have fought maybe Langford when Langford was young, I think them two would have had some great duels. But um, Harry was just, he was making his, I mean, he's another one. We, we spoke about it on our, when we done our special show and Harry Wills was avoided by Jack Dempsey. These guys were from a different grade. The following month, Sam fought Wills again, but he gave Langford an awful beating. He failed to answer the bell for round eight and returned to the United States after the fight. Sam and Joe fell out this year because he wouldn't take the advice from Joe to retire from the ring before he got hurt. Sam found a new manager instead in Howard Carr from Chicago. Jack Dempsey, who became the world champion in 1919 after beating Willard, wrote this in his book. The hell I feared no man. There was one man. He was even smaller than I. I wouldn't fight him because I knew he would flatten me. I was afraid of Sam Langford. Gunboat Smith, who fought both men, pondered the question during the Joe Lewis era of Langford versus Dempsey, both in their prime, and he said, It would have been bad news for Dempsey. He could be hit easily with a right hand, and if anybody has a right hand, it was the tar baby. I'll go further and declare that Langford would have waded through every heavyweight champ we've had, including the current soldier boy, Joe Lewis. Lewis was a great champ, I grant, but he's inclined to get hot and bothered when the going gets tough. Langford was as cool as an iceberg. Every minute he was in there, he never lost his head. This is more complimentary stuff, yet again, about Sam Langford. These people uh, that were in the ring with him, that shared the ring with people like Dempsey and Langford, Gumbo Smith saying that, he would have took them both. And these are two other heavyweight champions that are regarded as two of the best of all time. Sam, though, at this point, clearly passed his best. He continued to fight on in 1920. He had some decent success, though. Overall, we actually enjoyed a very good year. He won 20 of 25 contests. In the following year, he fought 18 times, winning 15. But all of these fights over those two years were against very average fighters at best, with all his old foes basically now retired. Now, by 1922, Sam was 36 and fighting with one good eye. He was overweight and he lost his speed, but yet he refused to call it a day. In speaking in 1922, he said, boxing is one of those sports where you can be too sportish after the old gong rings. The main idea is to win. You go out and beat or get beaten. And that means you've got to find the weak spot of the other fellow and keep banging away at it. He was basically mentioning the fact that he's one good eye. People noticed it and they kept knocking at that one good eye. They found that weak spot. The weak spot was that good eye. And he was going to show the effects Sam said the right eye would do some flickering after a while. I could see a little bit with it. Finally, a doctor informed him it was cataract and the surgery was the only way for cataract to be removed. The doctor advised Sam to quit fighting. Sam considered it, but after careful thought and no idea what else he would do in his life other than fight, he felt that he had no choice but to keep on swinging. His faults were that he'd probably lose sight of his eye, even if he didn't fight in a way, so he might as well carry on. Sam fought 20 times in 1922, winning 13, drawing four and losing three. His most impressive victory, though, came against the future middleweight champion, the Tiger Flowers, who was 34 and won at the time, by a second round knockout in Atlanta. Four of those other wins came in Mexico, the country he would call home for much of 1923. So he goes to Mexico, and while fighting in Albuquerque, New Mexico in early 1923, broken in desperate need for money, Sam learned about an elimination tournament in Mexico City promoted by Baldomero Romero for the heavyweight championship of Mexico. So he decided it might be a good way to make some money and pick up a title at the same time. He signed on as a participant, and Sam said, I'm plenty old, but not too old to be the champion of Mexico. He knocked out Jim Tracy and then Kid Brown to set up a final match against Jack Savage, who was 17, 27 and 17, who was younger but very nervous. Sam was originally the favourite, but once word spread that he was now going blind, the odds change. Once Sam realised the betting odds were going against him, he said, Don't worry about little Sammy. I don't need to see that boy. I just gotta feel him. Well, that's exactly what he did. He literally fought completely blind and attacked Savage once he cornered him knocking him out in the first round. Sam was the heavyweight champion of Mexico. A number of fans climbed into the ring and lifted the obviously pleasing and smiling new champion onto their shoulders. 
In his dressing room, a very happy Langford exclaimed, This is a great place. I'm going to stay here where I is the champion. His reign as Mexico's heavyweight champion actually lasted for four months until he was finally beaten by Clem Johnson. With his eye issues and with everything that had been going on, Sam was unable to continue due to being as blind as a bat. In round 13, he retired on his stool. How he's still fighting, I don't know. But I think he enjoyed those four months in Mexico and being the world champion. Those four months must have been lovely for him because he never got it in, in America. Now, fireman Jim Flynn was in Mexico City during Sam's short reign as the Mexican world heavyweight champion. And he spoke to a newspaperman about the game's hardest hitters. And he said, if you ask me, I'll say the hardest hitter I ever went up against was Sam Langford. I fought most of the heavyweights of the last 20 years. Jack Johnson among them. I think Langford could knock a fellow cold than any of them. It was like being hit with a baseball bat. Flynn was another one of those fighters who wouldn't give up the game. And he kept going. And he and Sam fought three times in Mexico in 1923 to January 1924. Sam began to reduce his fights to four or six rounders. And he fought a guy called Sammy Olsen. 10-7-3, 10, 7, and 3, because even his records, you know, these are just young kids. Back in America, and he won a four-round decision. Now, reports suggest that he used the ropes to guide himself to the corner, because he was just literally as blind as a bat. Now, the Halifax Herald wrote this after the fight. They said, Sam Langford is blind in one eye and will lose sight of the other eye unless he is able to raise money for an operation. It was learned today. Efforts are being made to arrange a benefit. Sam made a fortune and actually gave it away to fellows who were down and out, a friend declared. And now he is broke and going blind. Crazy, isn't it? How, how his life's starting so to take a, take a spiral now. He's, he's, this story starts to get even sadder as we go further into it. He actually fought four more times in 1924, stating, Nobody is soft. If you're trying to fight without hardly any sight because you can't see where the punches are coming from or where to throw yours. By that time, my right eye was so bad and knew that it was crazy for me to keep on fighting, even if I starved by not fighting. So I decided I'd fight just once more. In the end, he fought five more times in 1925 and decided to call it a day to an extent. He participated in a long interview about why he was skint and he explained in great detail. And this is what he said about his financial woes. In my day, I earned a lot of money. I don't know just how much, maybe it was about $500,000. When you first see that, you think it's an awful lot and figure I ought to have had a pile of it left. But boys, I haven't any of it left and I don't think I was what folks can call extravagant with it either. My manager got his share of that $500,000. Let's say his cut was 25%, about $125,000, which sounds like much, but it's little as regards what other managers got. Through the years, I had to pay trainers and handlers and also their expenses, training camp bills. I guess I spent about $100,000 that way, which isn't big when you remember it was spread over 23 years. He continued to break down all his expenses further before finishing off by saying, Yes, I earned about $500,000, but all I got out of it was $9,000 a year, and I was in a profession where a man has to be fairly liberal spender to get along, and where he was nearly always the boy who had to grab the dinner checks and pay them. The fact he didn't get those big fights, the, these, you know, the Jeanettes, the reason why they fight so often and so regularly is because they were getting something like 2000 to $3,000 for their fights. They was getting hardly anything. Comparing it to what the white fighters would get that were half as good as those guys, they were earning more money. But it was at least getting huge gates. You, you think about the gates that Jack Dempsey was getting, for instance. I know that it was a little bit later on, but... It, it just, it was just, it's so sad that these guys were never given a chance. The Joe Jeanettes, the Sam McVeighs and Sam Langfords and Harry Wills, those guys would be absolute heavyweight champions and legends of the sport if they were ever given a chance, but they weren't. On, on May 23rd, Sam arrived in New York City to undergo an eye operation by a Dr. James W. Smith. Dr. Smith would remove the cataract and preserve the sight of his right eye. He actually paid for this as well, Dr. Smith. It was, just, it was successful. Sam said, it's wonderful to be able to Take a man out of the darkness. There must be some marvellous man. You've made me the happiest man in the world. Only a man who lost his sight and had it brought back to him can understand how I feel. Just bless you all. 
Now, with the sight back in his eye, Sam did return to the ring in 1926 for two fights. But others suggest that he fought more in Mexico of those. He reckons he had 500 fights, Sam Langford. Uh, they just weren't documented. He did, however, finally call it a day on August 1926. Once again, he spoke of his money troubles. He says, yes, little Sammy is broke and little Sammy is more than half blind. I'm not complaining about it. That's the way things go. You either win or you lose. I've lost in fights and nobody heard me doing an awful lot of crying about it. If I lose now in the fight to save the last bit of sight, well, I just lose. That's all. Well, Sam, tell me, how long have you been ill? I've been here for the last five years. The hardest battle was <coughs> this third foot. That man who knocked out my left eye. And since then, I've been blind for five solid years. And I tell you, boys, it's great to be able to see again. When you can get out and look at the birds and the young girls going by. <laughs> Whatever does happen, I still can do a lot of laughing, even if I can't see and my pockets are flapping around in the wind, I can laugh about some of those funny things that happened to me in my fighting days. Now, Sam actually finished his boxing career with a record, a documented record of 178 wins, 126 by knockout, 29 defeats and 38 draws. It's crazy to think that he was still fighting with only one eye. It was being allowed to happen and he was still winning fights. And yet he only, <laughs> lost, mental, he only lost 29 of them. Out of all them fights he had, he only lost 29. Now, obviously, he says that he had close to 500 fights, with a lot of them not being documented. And uh, to be honest with you, I believe I believe that. I believe that's probably the case. It's just not documented, and there's no record of it, so he's unable to actually fully clarify it. But why would he say he had that many fights if he didn't? That, that era was just all about yeah. fighting, so it doesn't surprise me that he didn't have all these fights. So... Things were only going to get worse for Sam. To help Sam out financially, a benefit night was planned. The Chicago Defender urged fans to attend, writing this. A man who has carried the racist colour to all parts of the globe. A man who in the boxing ring was feared by all. And a man who has won the race. Many friends in all parts of the globe. The benefit for Sam was held at New York's Walker Athletic Club and it raised between $5,000 and $6,000. At this point, Sam was overcome with emotion. He was unable to speak, he was unable to talk, and he told the announcer, who was Humphrey, that he couldn't do that. So what he said was to tell the crowd, the people that was in attendance, to express his appreciation. Another person that was in that particular crowd was one of his old foes, Joe Jeanette, and he was brought to tears to see the condition that Sam Langford was in. Langford eventually went completely blind, and he ended up penniless living in Harlem, New York. In 1944, a newspaper column was published about his difficulty, after which close to $10,000 was donated by fans to help Langford. The column was titled, A Dark Man Laughs, and it was written by Al Laney of the New York Herald Tribune. Eventually, funding was obtained to pay for a successful eye surgery. Sam ended up in hospital as a result of blindness, lack of funds, and an inability to care for himself. His daughter, Charlotte, had been named his legal guardian and arranged for him to be cared for in the unplanned nursing home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. During his time in a nursing home, Sam was quoted as saying, Don't nobody need to feel sorry for old Sam. I had plenty of good times. I've been all over the world. I fought maybe 600 fights and everyone was a pleasure. Unfortunately, following that ill health, he did eventually pass away on January the 12th, 1956, less than two months shy of his 70th birthday. The official cause of death was listed as malnutrition and cerebral arterial sclerosis. He was buried in the Cambridge, Massachusetts Cemetery. Uh, that was an end, a really, really sad end to what was a an absolute storied career, fighting all these guys so many times. This man is like the uncrowned champion, a boxing legend, but a boxing legend that never was officially recognised as a world champion, even though we've told this story, we know that he was the world champion. At one point or another, he should have been recognised as a world champion. Absolutely. And and not even just in heavyweight division. In the, I mean, he missed out on that worldweight division against Barbados Walcott. Very close. People saying that he deserved to win that. He had the lightweight fight, which he beat Gans in, Joe Gans, and he would have won that if he had to come in 
on weight. No one actually explained that to him. He was only a young kid at the time. He would have won their light heavyweight champion at some point. The middleweight champion he should have won. He would have won against Stanley Ketch without a doubt. And the heavyweight championship, he this and and the size difference is just un, It's just it really does beg a belief that he could be that so small as he was, walking around as a middleweight and yet knock out heavyweights. It, it's just baffling. It, it blows my mind. It really does. And he is the uncrowned champion. He is the man, the the undisputed champion that no one ever really knows. And I think it's been great that we've been able to do this. And I mean, Langford was enshrined in the Ring Boxing Hall of Fame and Canada's Sports Hall of Fame in 1955. Many ring experts consider Sam the greatest pound-for-pound pound fighter in the history of boxing, and under different circumstances, he might have been a champion. As I said, I mean, the, the, we run through the division, the five-weight division, they're saying here, lightweight, welterweight, middleweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight. And Nat Fleischer, editor of The Ring magazine, called Sam one of the hardest punches of all time and ranked the little man seventh among his personal list of all-time great heavyweights. It's just endless. I think Sugar Ray Robinson turned around and called him the greatest ever middleweight, in his opinion, as well. And that's coming from Sugar Ray Robinson, who some people consider to be one of the great middleweights of all time, if not the greatest okay. welterweight of all time as well. Now, in 1999, Langford was voted Nova Scotia's top male athlete of the 20th century. In 2013, the jazz trio Tar Baby released a CD entitled Ballad of Sam Langford. In 2018, Langford was ranked fifth in a selection of the greatest 15 athletes in Nova Scotia's history. And I think well, there's one final thing that we need to say. It's a big thank you to Clay Moyle, the author of Sam Langford, Boxing's Greatest Uncrowned Champion, which actually was a great source for us to put this episode together. Thank you, Clay, for, for an absolutely great book and some great source material for this particular episode. We've, we've thoroughly enjoyed doing it, Johnston. You know, when we talked about doing this off air we were talking about what fighters we're going to do who's coming up next and Sam Langford's always one of them fighters that just gets left out because of you know the significance of so many other different fighters over the periods of time but as we've rightly heard through the course of the episode he should have been the heavyweight champion of the world he should have been probably a four or five weight world champion <laughs> it's just crazy to think that he was the champion that people forget he was the uncrowned champion that people never even think about when you think of that era, everyone thinks of Jack Johnson. After hearing all the stories about Jack Johnson, it's quite evident that he really didn't want no part of Sam Langford. And that was a, the one big fight that, even though they'd fought once and Johnson had won that fight convincingly, the second time around, it sounds like it was going to be a completely different affair. And it sounds like, from all accounts of people who were there at the time and who lived through that time, that Sam Langford would have destroyed Jack Johnson. And Jack Johnson knew it, and that's why you never took that fight. Never took that fight. Didn't want to go nowhere near it. And he wanted to make money. That was his main aim, Jack Johnson. I, I had an idea of it from when ESPN said he was like the best ever on crown champion and, you know, the unknown champion. And, and that sort of intrigued me because it was a few years I don't know how long ago it was now, but then I sort of read about him a little bit and I sort of thought, wow, it does sound like a really good fighter kind of thing. Didn't really look too much into it. And then when I look a little bit further and I was like, actually, yeah, no, this guy's proper legit. Like He's up there, one of the best ever. Pan for pan, without a doubt. And then when we do this and we read this book and then we, we watch some of the documentaries that are, that are out there, there's a few out there. There's one in terms of with just the black fighters in history and jug into this world and all the way up to Ezra Charles, for instance. And just how they were shut out. They were shut out. They, these white guys through the colour line, it was so difficult for him to be given these opportunities. When Jack Johnson did win that title, the race riots kicked off. Hence why that middleweight title didn't happen. I mean, we didn't go into this great detail, but you can see the timeline for yourself. You now you've got innocent young black civilians being hung because Jack Johnson won a fight. For Sam Langford to then go and fight Stanley Ketchell and potentially beat him, He's got guys saying he's going to shoot him in the ring if he does knock him out. That is that was the times. That was absolutely the times. And if Langford had beaten Stanley Ketchell to become a middleweight champion right there and then, if you consider all the racial riots that happened after Jack Johnson, could you imagine if what would have happened if Sam done it as well? That's why he was just shut out by the authorities. And the police commissioner knew it. Whether we like it or not, whether we call them racist, or in actual fact, did they save lives in the long run? It is such a weird thing to say because racism was so blatant back then. And even with these quotes, Sean, I mean, we went through these quotes and we've had to eliminate some words out of this because some of the words were so bad. 
the fact that he was called the Boston Tar Baby, I mean, that is so bad as well. I mean, the, the, the racial segregation was just evident in this episode. And, and I can't help but just feel so sorry for Sam Langford that he was never given a chance. And the fact that Jack Johnson, he weren't interested, sort of pisses me off a little bit. And I can understand why it, it pisses you off, to be fair, because it does me. You know, I, I, I love what Jack Johnson stood for in his career. I really do. But I really do feel sorry for Sam Langford the guy that just never got the opportunity even though we've said profusely throughout the course of the episode he should have been cast as the heavyweight champion of the world it's it's an absolute travesty to be honest with you that 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 this happened but it's been good to do i've really enjoyed it johnson i've really really enjoyed this episode and i hope that people really enjoy listening to this i hope you guys have listened have enjoyed it and i hope we've done it some justice i hope we've educated you a little bit like we've been educated on sam langford and his life and his career and his times and if you've enjoyed it please let us know go on to twitter at career underscore profiles give us a tweet let us know what you think or just share the episode give us a retweet and a like a like and a share on facebook go on instagram give us a like on there please let us know what you think of the episode and if there's anything you think we've missed also let us know as well please we're open to constructive criticism all the time let us know if there's anything you want us to cover for the upcoming episodes for career profiles big shout out of course to the patrons who support this podcast we really appreciate your support and your love that you're giving us to help us continue on to produce all these series based episodes and provide you with all this different level of boxing content we also appreciate every other single person that listens to us that downloads us that shares that retweets and shows us the love on social media we do really appreciate all that support i hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode the career of sam the boston bone crusher langford